I thought I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing, even though I didn't know I was practicing. Welcome to church! <laughs> My name is Bailey, and I go to Lawrenceville campus. Yeah, so I did not really grow up in a household where we talked about God very often. We didn't go to church on Sundays, rarely ever, and my parents ended up putting me in a Christian school when I was in seventh grade, and I ended up graduating from there. But it was always really confusing growing up to know that I wasn't going to church with my family on Sundays, but I was put in a Christian school. I remember times where I would dive really deep into my faith, and then times where I would kind of distance myself a little bit, and I felt like I was just kind of one foot in, one foot out throughout high school. And senior year is when my relationship with God really did dwindle towards the end of it. I just really distanced myself from my faith at that point because I was mad. I was mad at God at the time. I had just come home from Milledgeville and I had been thinking like, I need to get connected with the church. I need to start going again. And the next day this friend reached out to me and asked if I wanted to go to C12 with her. I had never heard of it. I didn't know what it was. The first time that I went, it, it just felt like it unlocked something, I guess. And I know a lot of people say something was missing, but genuinely that's what it felt like. September of 2022, I fully just dove into it and started really taking my faith seriously. Um, I just felt a push to go, that I needed to go on a mission trip. And I kind of ignored it. And I just kept like, no, I'm not ready for that. I'm, I'm, I am I'm, honestly felt like I was not worthy enough to go. And I just felt like a huge weight on my chest that I needed to go on this mission trip. So my friend and I, we both went to Guatemala together. And once we came back from that trip, meeting people there and just other people at C12, that's when I finally found my community all together. And that was a year ago this month, actually. I knew coming back from Guatemala that I wanted to start serving and do growth track. For C12, I'm on new guest team. So a lot, a lot of the time I'm just having conversations with people who are walking in for the very first time. They don't know what to expect. They don't know really where to go, who to talk to. We just try our best to make them feel welcome, make them feel comfortable. And I want these people to know that they are never too far gone to experience the love of God. Somebody. That's a beautiful story, and that, and that is what it's like in heaven. No one's too far gone for the love of God, so I'm so glad that you're with us this week, and I think by the time you're done today, you're going to say, I'm really glad that I made this a part of my weekend because uh, God's got something awesome in store for us, and, and if, if you showed up today, we're right in the middle of a season in the life of our church where we're talking about the kingdom of God and the order of the kingdom of God. And that story told a little bit of the order where, man, there's something missing. And what Jesus wants to do is not just change your outside, but to change you from the inside to the outside. And that's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus. And that's why we exist here as a church. And we've been talking about the order of the kingdom and sitting inside of Romans 12, 1 and 2. Here's what it says. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now, do not conform to the pattern of this world, the order of this world, the way the world works, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And there's an order of the world, an order of the kingdom. And in this season, we're trying to point us to a higher order, the kingdom of God. And today is going to be a unique and special day because we have a special guest with us and because we believe that there's an order to how things work. And maybe when you grew up in the church, the way that you experienced church, the order was different than it is today. Things like, it's not okay to laugh at church. I grew up in a church where, man, if you laugh, it's bad days for you. And here's the reality. I want you to see this. The upside down nature of the kingdom of God is this. You can laugh in church. Because if God was just some like scary older dude up on a throne up there as king, he didn't want to hear you laugh. Can I tell you this? What good father doesn't want to hear his kids laugh? And I'm going to tell you something. Today, you are going to laugh. Because our special guest, hopefully you know him, is Michael Jr. And he is with us today. And we're, you can celebrate that. We're excited. He is, 
He is a comedian and an author, and he's a, he's a comedic thought leader. He's been on The Tonight Show. He's, he's written books. Like he's, He makes me feel like a failure at life. Let's just say that. He's, he's brilliant in every way, shape, and form. And he's good looking, too. Anyway, it got weird. Uh, he's with us today, and here's what's going to happen. You're going to laugh a ton today because he's so gifted. He's hilarious. Don't miss it. You're going to learn today. God's got a word for our church. He's got a word for you personally here across the campuses. And, and, and of all the things I could put on his biography and we could put on his job description, all the things he's done, the thing that marks him the deepest is the fact that he had an encounter with Jesus. And he's a follower of Jesus. And he loves Jesus. And he hears from Jesus. And today, he's going to invite us into his journey with Jesus. Will you help me welcome our guest here across the campuses, Michael Jr.? Yo, that is an awesome dude. I like that guy a lot. He's awesome, for real. Took me out to eat. What was that place? Hooters. Oh, it was delightful. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm just playing. I didn't go. Um, no, I've, I've been able to spend a little bit of time behind the scenes with Jason and his squad, his team, and they're really... Like, they really care about you. I'm not saying that because of something they said. I, my job is to read audiences and read people. And that's what I've been doing is I've been around them, and they absolutely love you. When I say you, I'm not just talking about the people in this room in Lawrenceville. I'm also talking about the people at Beaufort. <laughs> I didn't know that was a real place. <laughs> I thought that was like a person you don't mess with in prison. <laughs> we got Hampton Hills. We got Brazelton. Brazelton, that's what I said. <laughs> we got Jackson. Everybody got Jackson because of the Jackson 5. And then it was 4 or 3. It went down. And then we got uh, Snellville. You guys move slower there, I guess. <laughs> Athens, I've been there. And then we got Flowerly Branch. Whatever, I just got here. And then Sugarloaf, I want to say hello to all of the cats. Who did I miss? Did I miss somebody? You, I didn't miss you. You know, the Lord knows you're there. So I'm super excited about what's going to happen today. This has been great. I've been baptizing people. <laughs> let me tell you about the first time I got baptized. This is impromptu. I didn't plan it. So first, let me tell you how I learned how to swim. <laughs> yeah, I got to start with that. This is how I learned how to swim. So I'm like, how old am I? I'm going to forget that phone when I leave. So I'm like... Me and my dad are fishing off the bridge. I'm like 11 years old. The fish not really biting, right? My dad was like, okay, let's have some fun. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> That's how I learned how to swim. Still don't really know how to do it, to be honest with you. Fast forward, I'm about to get baptized. I have not been submerged underwater since the bridge. Dude gonna push me, right? I'm like, you know what? I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm all creative. I got these creative thoughts. I'm like, wait a minute. It's a white dude. He got on a white sheet. I don't know if this is right. I don't know if this is right. <laughs> I'm like, you push me again, it's going to be trouble in the water. And then when they baptize you, what do they say? In the name of the Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Dunk you in the water. I was reading the Bible that Jesus got baptized. Well, what did they say to him? It was like, you, your daddy, and your best friend. <laughs> I don't know what, I remember getting baptized. But that was long, I got baptized, like, I got to first tell you my church experience, when the first time I ever went to church, I'm seven years old, and church was miserable. By the way, there's three verses of scripture that I'd love for you to write down, because they're going to apply to what we talk about today. So if you can write them down, I think they're going to pop in a new way as a result of what happens today. Jeremiah 29, 11, and then there's John 10, 27. And then also, third Romans, four, <laughs> just check it, just check it. Somebody just wrote it down. All right, third Romans, I heard that. That's a good one. There's no third Romans, people. And the last one is uh, Revelations 3.20. So write those down. I think they'll pop in a new way as a result of what we talk about today. So I'm seven years old, and my grandmother forced me to go to this church. I don't want to go to church. Church was miserable. You don't understand. My shoes, I was so uncomfortable at church. My shoes were like three sizes too small. But my grandmother had this thing called a shoehorn. So if your foot don't fit, now it do. The church lasts like six hours. So 
So my toes is barred up for six hours. Then we go in the basement and eat a sandwich and come back up like that was halftime or something. My clothes were so tight. My shirt, every Sunday I wore a white, a white and brown shirt. It was so tight. Actually, it was just white, but the buttons were so tight that the... <laughs> it was miserable. I, go to, I walk into this church, I'm seven years old, and this, this dude is up on stage, and he is mad at everybody. This is what I thought. From seven years old, he looked like he's mad, and I thought he was mad because of the phlegm he had caught in his throat. Because at the end of every sentence, he would try to get it out, but he couldn't. He'd be like, the Lord said, ah. Act like you're ha. Ah. I'm like, Grandma, he need to gargle or something, Grandma. And he had a Bible in his hand. He kept playing like he was going to throw it at people. He'd be like, the Lord, ha. Ah. Ah. And everybody gets scared. He'd be like, hey, man, hey, man. I realized now they were saying, hey, man. I didn't know. I was seven years old. One time I went to church, there was a dead body in the front. Nobody explains to a seven year old Michael Jr., it's a funeral, it's not church. I'm thinking, yo, that's how they roll. Like every few weeks or so, they bring a dead body in as an example or something. The dude on stage would yell at us like, we did it. I asked my grandma, I was like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? I didn't understand any of that stuff. Then it'd be like, we got to this, we gonna go to the sister church. I don't even like the brother church. I don't wanna be here. <laughs> that stuff was miserable. And then I was in the kids' choir. I, w I was in the kids' choir. I can't sing. I just happened to be a kid. And they got the dude in the box, and then what song? What song they got us singing? You, you gonna know the song. What song we got to sing? Soon and very soon, we are gonna see the king. I don't wanna see the king. That's what happened to the man in the box. It was miserable. Now, I just didn't like church. 14 years old, instead of forcing me to go to church, my grandmother did something different. She asked me if I wanted to go. I was like, let me think this over. <laughs> no. So I stopped going to church. I just hung out with my friends. We couldn't do too many things because we were broke. Growing up, we were broke. We had no money. I was actually being sponsored by a family from Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's a funny joke, man. Some Christians don't know what to do with that joke. You can't laugh and shake your head. <laughs> when you don't have any money, you get creative. I remember I wanted an action figure. I wanted this action figure. My dad, my birthday comes along. My dad hands me a box. I open it up. It was empty. He said, it's invisible, man. I played with that thing for three weeks. So my brother hid it from me, man. I couldn't find it nowhere. It was also at this age I started noticing that I was struggling with my reading. Now, I kind of knew this before, but I didn't really, like, I didn't care about it at the time. But I'm noticing I'm struggling with my reading, right? And oh, by the way, me and my friend made this deal when we were 14 years old. Let's be real. I'm not going to church. I don't go to church. I'm not thinking about church. We made this deal, this little side deal. If he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest hard as he wanted to. Just because we wanted to, we wanted to stop cursing. Just, we said we wanted to expand our vocabulary. So if he heard me curse, he could hit me in the chest as hard as he wanted to, and vice versa. And Duke could hit hard. I stopped cursing immediately. <laughs> so we made up that deal, and we played other violent games. Remember the game Slug Bug? If you're from the East Coast, they call it Punch Bug. Here's how the game works. You see a Volkswagen Bug, you get to hit your friend. Those are all the instructions. In my neighborhood, they would add to the game. You ever play Uppercut Fire Truck? What about minivan body slam? You ever play that game? There was always one crazy dude in the group who would make up games on the spot, like hitch on the throat tall building. <laughs> you play too much, man. So as I mentioned, when I was about 14 years old, I noticed how much I was struggling with my reading and compared to other kids. Like I just couldn't read as clearly as everyone else. I read fine now, by the way, like the signs over the doors that say excite. I could read that. But I used to struggle with my, I couldn't sound words out phonetically, so my mind would start to scramble. I'd look at the font size, the color, the positioning, what's in front of it, what's behind it, how people are responding to the word. I came up with seven different ways to look at a word to determine what the word was. Then I got really good at it, to the point in high school, people didn't know I wasn't really reading. I was just working it out really, really fast. Now as an adult, I read just fine. 
but I still have this ability to look at words and people and situations seven different ways almost immediately. In fact, it's the primary place that I pull my comedy from. So that very thing from my past that looked like it was a handicap, I thought I was dealt a bad hand. God didn't cause it, but he's used it in preparation for what he has me to do. It's almost as if I was practicing even though I didn't know I was practicing. Let me say this again so you can hear what I'm saying. The fact that you never met your dad before, your parents were divorced, your mom was an alcoholic, you were molested as a child, you were raped. God did not cause that, but he'll use it in preparation for what he has for you to do. Chances are you've been practicing. Maybe you didn't know you were practicing. I'm here right now to let you know you've been practicing. And for a lot of you guys, it is game time. But you've got to be able to hear the coach's voice. So as a result of my practice, I find funny everywhere. It just shows up. I'm at the airport. This cool little white kid walked up to me, asked for an autograph. I was like, cool, what's your name, buddy? He said, I'm Tanner. I was like, no, you're not. <laughs> you are white as can be, buddy. There you go. There you go. <laughs> People ask weird questions. Michael Jr., where are you from originally? Originally, huh? Well, I was conceived in Michigan. Yeah, before that, I was with my dad. Then there's a swim competition, right? And, uh, and I won, which is crazy, right? Because I, I forgot how to swim now. It's the craziest thing, man. Which joke are you on, ma'am? <laughs> the laugh was a little delayed. I just want to point that out. It was a little delayed. So now I have this ability to find funny. <laughs> Every, I'm just going to do this joke. It popped in my head. I feel like I'm supposed to do it. Okay, here it is. So this, the reason I'm going to do this joke is it's, it's one of my favorite jokes. It's a, it's a time release joke. Some of you guys are going to get this joke immediately. Some of you anywhere from 7 to 14 seconds later. A few of you, not today. It's okay, that's just where you are. It's early for you. You was out last night. Whatever the case is, right? So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to do the joke, and I want you to enjoy the joke, but then I want you to listen for the pockets of people who are getting the joke at different times. It's going to cause you to giggle all over again. It's the joke that continues to give. Here it is. I'm thinking about opening up some restaurants in the north. Uh, I'm probably going to call it, probably gonna call it uh, African American Barrel. It's probably going to call it. Are you explaining the joke right now? You're explaining it? It's great, great. It's just, it's just what we need to do this morning. It's great, it's great. So I hope you're tracking. When we went from 7 to 14 years old, lady, don't work on that joke. Don't. You're not going to. Don't, don't. Went from 7 to 14 years old, 26 years old, I moved to New York City. The reason I moved to New York City is because I'm doing comedy, and I want to know for sure if I'm funny. And in New York, if you're not funny, the way they let you know is they'll say something like, you're not funny. So I moved to New York City, and there's this club there called the Comic Strip Live, and it's a really hard club to get into. In fact, they used to have an open mic on Tuesday nights that started at 7 p.m. Well, comedians who were new in town, like myself, would start lining up at 6 a.m. in the morning to do 90 seconds in front of their manager. It's a really hard club to get into. So it's finally my turn to perform at the Comic Strip Live, and right before I get on stage, a comedian named George Wallace walks in. George Wallace is very established as a comedian, so when he comes in, whoever's next gets bumped automatically. The manager's already walking over to me. I know I'm about to get bumped. But no, this is where God shows up for the first time in my life. Well, this is where I noticed him. So the manager says to me, listen, Michael Jr., uh, George Wallace is here. Would you like to go on before him or after him? That never happens. That never happens. I was like, before him, please. So I'm going before George Wallace, and I got New Yorkers laughing, but not only are they laughing, he comes in the room, and he's laughing as well. After the show, there's a bunch of comedians that are all asking him questions. He leaves them, and he walks over to me. He says, you know what? You're really funny, and you're clean. He said, let me ask you a question. He's like, why don't you curse? I was like, I don't know. What if my grandmother walk in or something? <laughs> my grandmother wasn't coming to New York, let alone a comedy club. What was I going to say? My friend might hit me in the chest. I'm a grown man. I didn't have any reason not to curse. I just didn't curse at the time. It was really God setting me up. So he says to me, you're funny, you're clean. I'd like for you to do a show with me and my best friend. I didn't know who his best friend was. I'm pumped and excited. Find out later, his best friend is Jerry Seinfeld. We did two shows together. I got two standing ovations. I rip. I'm like, yes, I'm the man. After the show, 
club manager approaches me. And he said, Mike, you have some great sets, really funny stuff. Let me ask you a question. He said, um, would, you, uh, would you like to go to church with me this weekend? And I was like, church? <laughs> I was like, man, back up. You're making my feet hurt. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> so let me pause for a second in the story. I actually did have almost like a conscious, subconscious thought of back up. You're making my feet hurt. Why would I have such a thought? Because remember, when I was a kid going to church, my shoes were actually three sizes too small, and I'd sit in church all day. So I had built up a negative neuro association that said church equaled pain. But I wasn't aware enough. I wasn't curious enough about why I didn't like something. Therefore, I continued to run from God or stay away from him, assuming it was the people as opposed to the lie that I believed unknowingly. Is it possible that there's something that you or somebody watching online that you believe about church that, that is not a, it's just a horizontal lie. It is not a vertical truth. So let me jump back into the story. So I said, no, I don't want to go to church, man. I'm cool. 20 minutes later, his fiance asked me the same question, but she was fine. <laughs> she was beautiful. She pales in comparison to my wife now, but this woman was beautiful. <laughs> this woman was beautiful. She was so, I had never, like, I was like, wow, she was beautiful. And she had this accent too. She said, Michael Jr., would you like to go to church with us? I was like, I was just looking for a church the other day, man. It's crazy, man. So I go to this church, right? And I can't even find these people. And I'm sitting in the back, and this, and this dude walks out on stage, and he's just talking about Jesus. He's just talking. He's just explaining Jesus like Jason. He's not screaming. He's not yelling. He don't got no perm. He's just talking <laughs> about Jesus. Then he did this thing where he did like an altar call. He said, if you want Jesus in your life, all you have to do is believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth. Raise your hand. Come forward over, and Jesus is yours. And yo... 12 stone, I really wanted to do it. Like, I really, really wanted to, but I was like, nah, I got to read the pamphlet first. Because I knew a couple Christians, and they was creepy. There's some creepy Christians out there. If you don't know any creepy Christians, it's you. <laughs> you are the creepy Christian. Your friends know one. So I told myself, no, nah, I can't just, I'm not just going to give my life over. I don't even know what that means. And so I told myself I'd read the, I got to read the pamphlet first. Like, so I told myself I'd read the Bible first. I didn't even have a Bible. I didn't know it was that big. This lady randomly, at like this mall area, randomly approaches me and hands me a Bible. We don't even exchange any words. She just hands me a Bible and walks off. So I took the Bible home and I opened it up and I'm like, okay, I said I was going to read it. Let me read it. First, I read the copyrights. The Bible was made in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm like, me too. That's crazy, man. Hey, man we, we never met before. That's crazy, man. So I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to church. I'm reading the Bible. Now I really want to get my life over to Jesus. But I told myself I'd read the Bible first. Now, you don't have to do this. I just wanted to stick to what I said. So I'm reading the Bible, going to church. I got to the part about the job. I'm like, no wonder. I don't want one of them. That's crazy, man. Let me keep going. So I'm keep reading. I'm going to church. I'm going to church. Now, I'm really getting excited. Like, I want to get my life over to Jesus, but I'm still reading. I got to the part in Matthew where it said Jesus died for me. I did not know until I was 27 years old that Jesus died for me. Yeah, like, I didn't know until I read it right there in Matthew. Then I turned to Mark, and he died again. I'm like... <laughs> I got to Luke, and he died. I get to John. I'm like, why are you going back in the garden, Jesus? You know what's going to happen? Why are you going in there? Listen, I wish that was a joke I wrote, for real. I thought he died four times. I didn't know. So I remember finished reading the Bible up, and I go to, and I go get to church, and I can't wait to the end, because normally they give you access to Jesus at the end, right? But I'm like, yo, is he here now? And I run up to the altar, and I give my life to Jesus. And I realize now, I used to just think I was funny. Now I understand I'm funny for a reason. Like, there's purpose behind me having a sense of humor. And there's some celebrities that you would know, right? They ask me questions about God. They say stuff like, explain God to me. First of all, I can't explain God. If I could, he wouldn't be God. And then, then this guy shifted his question. He said, well, how is it I can do all of this stuff that I'm doing? And this dude, I mean, if you knew, he's doing a lot of stuff. He said, how is it that people say that Jesus still wants a relationship with me, even though I'm doing this stuff? And this is all I could come up with at the time. And this isn't even, as, this, this doesn't come close to explaining God, but this is all I had. I said, it's kind of like being in a car with a navigation device. 
You ever been in a car with a navigation device before? You guys ever been in a car before? We can start there. You ever been in a car? It's like being in a car with a navigation device. If it says go 10 blocks and turn left, then you go 10 blocks and turn right. It doesn't abandon what you're supposed to do. It recalculates what you need to do to get to where you're supposed to be based upon where you are. The only problem is, is if you keep making the wrong turns, the road conditions may be rougher. It may take longer, and you're running out of time. So you want to be sensitive to listen to that voice so you can make the right choice about where you're supposed to be. And that voice sounds an awful lot like a coach because you haven't been practicing for nothing. It's game time. So now, now I'm to the point where I've got to choose a story. What's your name? Up front. Yes. Stacy. Stacy got dimples. I love dimples on women. That's so cute, man. Only in the front. I want to say that. Just want to say that. Um, <laughs> Stacy. Um, I got to choose between these two stories, right? I don't want to go over on time. Make sure. So I got this. The first time I did the Tonight Show or the, when I went to prison. Which of those two stories would you prefer? Prison. Really? I, I, I can tell where you're from. See what's going on. See what's going on. It's too bad. Doing the Tonight Show. Anyways. <laughs> so I'm going to try to squeeze them both in. I don't think I can. Okay. So New York was too expensive. It was way too expensive. So I've, I met Jesus. And so I feel like I'm supposed to move to California. Because it's too expensive in New York. <laughs> My cousin had a couch. He said, if I can get to the couch, I can live on his couch. It's fine. By the way, there's a whole story I just told you. I was homeless living in my car. I talk about this in my book, but I'm homeless living in my car. So I moved to California. There's a comedy club in California called uh, the County of Magic Club. It is probably the best club in the country. It's so prestigious, I can't get inside the club. It's just, I can't. But George Wallace calls me up and says, hey, do you want to go to the County of Magic Club? I was like, yes. So he takes me to the club. He can't get me on stage. He can only get me in the club. After the show, he takes me into the green room. In the green room are some soldiers in comedy. There's Jay Leno. There's Gary Shanley. There's George Wallace. And I'm sitting there nibbling on fries with these dudes. Now, the reason, they had this big spread of food, all sorts of food. But I'm only eating French fries because I actually don't feel like I belong in the room. So I'm just nibbling on fries. And at the time, they're working on a joke. Some of you guys may remember a football player got hit in the eye with a flag, and he was suing a league for $400 million. And now Jay Leno and all of these guys are working on that subject because this guy can't see out of one eye. They're working on that subject for the monologue on The Tonight Show. I ain't saying nothing. I'm just happy to be in a room with these guys. But your gift will make room for you. So I'm sitting there, and I'm working on a joke. Then it got quiet, and they looked at me, and I was like, oh, snap. This is an opportunity. I was like, all right, let me see if I got this right. He got hit in the eye with a flag. He lost his vision in one eye, and he's soon to leave for $400 million. Um, he's not going to see half of it. <laughs> for real. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't as much pressure as you might think because I'd been practicing unknowingly as a child who was struggling with his reading. I was practicing. I was prepared for that moment. You've been practicing. You were prepared for these moments. I didn't even know I was practicing, but I was ready. I'm going to fly through this next story, okay? Dimples. <laughs> First time, so I have a nonprofit that we started called Funny for the Forgotten, where we go to homeless shelters and prisons and abuse children's facilities. So my first time ever going into a prison, I'm scared for real. I gotta be real with you, I was scared. The warden took my belt. He's like, you can't have a belt. Somebody might try to hang you. <laughs> can't they just boo me like regular people? Couldn't they just boo somebody? I'm in prison, my pants loose. Like, this is a bad idea, man. I'm just... So I'm walking in this prison, and I'm scared, man. And they got, I got eight guards around me, so I shouldn't be like eight guards. And we're walking in, and the bars are open. You take a few steps, some more bars. Some, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Welcome home. <laughs> so I'm scared, and I'm walking in this prison, man. And the bars, the guards slowly start peeling off one by one. I don't know if they get hit with dark guns. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> get to the last set of bars. There's one dude left. He's like, this as far as I go. I was like, well, me too, man. I'm not going in there. <laughs> but I know God is saying go. I know he's saying go, because we bring funny to the forgotten. So I'm, I walk in there, and there's all these prisoners, right? And they're in this little, they're all in this circle sitting down, and 
and there's a hole in the middle of the circle, and I guess that's what I'm supposed to do jokes at. But I need a joke immediately, and I got nothing popping up as I'm walking to the little hole in the middle because that's where I got to do the jokes. And I, if I don't do a joke and probably make them laugh in the first 12 seconds, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm walking, and I look, look like I'm cool on the outside, but I got nothing. Nothing's popping up. Seven different ways to nothing. I got four steps left. Nothing's popping up. I had one joke pop up, but I didn't want to start with it. I was going to be like, you know what? You guys are a captive audience. I just want to say that. <laughs> Didn't feel a piece of my spirit about that joke. So I'm walking. I got two steps left. I still got nothing. I got nothing. I got nothing. I settled this last foot, and for real, sitting right up front is a white dude with a white beard named Moses. I was like, thanks, Lord. When I said these words, the place exploded in laughter. We had an amazing time. I said, Moses, this is what I want you to do. When you see the prison warden, I want you to look him in his eye. You look him right in his eye, and I want you to say, let my people go. How did I get that joke that fast under that much pressure? It wasn't as much pressure as you might think because I've been practicing since I was a child in the form of a kid who was struggling with his reading. I've been practicing just like you've been practicing. The other thing I'd like you to catch from that story is I didn't know what I was going to say or what I was going to do until I got my feet where they needed to be. That is confirmation that you are doing God's stuff. You may not understand, but all you have to do is hear his voice and then make the next step. So me and my wife were looking at some old home videos of our youngest daughter being born. I wasn't super old. I wasn't like a VHS or something. Some of the kids are like, what's of a hush? <laughs> so I'm going to show you a video of our youngest daughter being born. Not being born because I'm not going to show you that video because that's just not right. I'm just going to. So let me set this video up for you. I am the videographer. I took this video, but I didn't understand the power of it until I watched the video. So at the time, our daughter is like two and a half minutes old. And they got her under a little chicken warmer, a little <laughs> french fry warmer. I don't know what kind of insurance we had, but that's what they got her under, a little chicken warmer thing. And they got her under a little chicken warmer. The nurse is about to clean her up, and she starts to cry. I want you to notice what happens when she hears my voice. Okay, Portland, look, I'm right here. It's okay, it's okay. I'm right here, I'm right here. We're doing just fine. It's okay, it's okay, I'm right here. Right here, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, baby. That's very powerful. Now, it's like seven, maybe seven and a half minutes later, the nurse is done cleaning her up, and she starts to cry again. I speak up, and she stops crying again. But I want you to notice what happens when I tell her I love her. Portland, it's okay. It's okay. It's good. It's good. It's good. I'm right here. I'm right here. I am right here. I love you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, I'm right here. I'm right here. It's okay. It's okay. So listen. There will be times in life where you feel like you've just been practicing and practicing and practicing. And maybe you're growing frustrated, even to the point of tears. The key thing to do in those moments is to be still and listen for the Father's voice. Because he is talking to you. And what he wants you to know is that he loves you. He's right here. All you have to do is open your eyes. You hear some music? Yeah, not yet, man, not yet. You're getting us emotional, not yet, not yet. I'm sitting here, Lord, is that you? No, no, it's, it's that dude right there, man. Calm yourself down, bro. Getting the song, I'm like, Lord, you speaking to me today. No, no, it's, it's not your concert. I just want to let you know that. Just... So I have one more story I want to tell. Well, first I have to come, I want to tell you how I came up with this story, right? And then after I tell you how I came up with this story, then that dude's supposed to slide in right there. <laughs> so this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. And the way I came up with this story is I was just doing what I do, which I highly recommend you just do what you do and listen. So I was writing comedy. 
And in the middle of writing comedy, I was writing comedy about, a, I was writing a joke about the good room. How many people in here know what the good room is? Raise your hand. Other campuses. How many people know what the good room is? So there's only a few hands going up. The reason is, is I never finished writing a joke. But the truth is, is mostly all of you know what the good room is. Let me explain. The good room is that room in your grandmother's house or your aunt's house, or maybe your house. It's that one room It's better than the rest of the house. Can't nobody go in there, it's plastic on the furniture. It's really just for looks. How many people know what the good room is now? Raise your hand. Other campuses too, absolutely. So I'm, I'm in the middle, I'm writing this joke about the good room and God stops me and says, no, I want you to tell this story to my kids instead. So I'm gonna tell you this story. Now would be a great time to jump in there if you want to, that'd be a great time. He was early and late. He must be mixed. He must be mixed. So early and late. <laughs> he must be mixed. <laughs> what? Come on, y'all know what that is, right? Y'all know, because, yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> Listen, we're laughing in the middle of what could be a life changing moment for some people. God is awesome. So, this is a story about having a relationship with Jesus. It's an interactive story. So I want you to imagine, imagine that you are a house and outside of the house is Jesus Christ and he wants to come in, but he'll never force his way in. He wants you to invite him in. And the reason some people in this room, the reason you haven't invited Jesus into the house is because you cool. Everything seems fine the way it is. So it would seem. Whenever you need something, whenever something happens, you walk up to the door, you crack it open, you say a little prayer, you tell them what happened, you close the door and you go back into the house. But that's not a relationship at all. How can you hear his voice under those circumstances? How can you truly utilize the practice under those circumstances? And the reason you won't let him into the house is because your house is a mess. And you think you need to get it together or clean it up a little more first. You got to get things right. There's some stuff you want to do first. There may be drugs or pornography in the house or relationships. You brought other people in your life thinking that somehow maybe they could help you clean it up. But they can't. The only one who can clean it up is standing outside the door wearing an apron with a bucket in his hand waiting on you to truly open the door. Then there's other people in here watching right now. You used to have Jesus in the whole house. But whether you realize it or not, you've moved him to just one room in the house, the good room. Have you ever noticed how the good room most of the time is the one right up front with the big window? So when people look in, they think the whole house is clean. But it's not. It's just that one room. So when they hear about you coming to church, I think the whole house is clean, but it's not. It's just that one room. You quote scripture, but it's just that one room. You give money, but it's just that one room. You got a Bible verse tattooed on your body. It's just that one room. Jesus wants access to the whole house. And I'm telling you, if you would just open this door and let them in, they'll show up with a contractor named the Holy Spirit. And they will make sure the house is functioning the way it was intended to. But none of this happens if you don't open a door because he will not. He will never force his way in. Other people may have tried to force him in, but they can't. He'll only come in if you invite him in. So if everyone in here, if you could just close your eyes and bow your head at every campus. If you know this is you that I'm talking to right now, and you need to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to give him full access to the house. I'm going to ask you to do something really simple. On the count of three, I just simply want you to put your hand in the air. Don't overthink this. But if this is you and you need to invite Jesus into your house, whether it be for the first time or to give him full access to the house again, every campus, on the count of three, I simply want you to put your hand in the air. One, two, three. Nice and high. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. All right, go ahead and put your hands down and then look up at me. First thing I want to say to you is I'm proud of you. And listen, I don't, more times than not, God will give me a number of how many times I need to repeat that phrase because there's some people in the room watching right now who have never received that from a father's voice before. 
So I'm going to repeat that phrase, and this isn't just for the people who raise their hand, but I'm going to repeat that phrase, and what I want you to do right now is simply work to receive it from a father's voice. I am proud of you. 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 I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. I am proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I am proud of you. So proud of you. Yes, you. I am proud of you. Now, this next thing is for everyone who raised their hand, and even those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and remain standing so we can pray together. This is very important, because if you can't do this in here where we're proud of you, you won't be able to do it out there. When you raised your hand, it was like you were reaching for the doorknob. But when you stand up and we do this prayer together, it's as if you were blowing the door open so Jesus can come into the house. This is very important. This is for every campus. This is for those who raised their hand and those who should have raised their hand. On the count of three, I want you to stand up and remain standing. And to help with that, everyone around you, they're going to applaud as loud as they can. But it will not compare to the applause that the angels in heaven will be doing when you stand to your feet and remain standing. One, two, three. Just stand up and remain standing. Praise God. If you're standing, don't clap. Just receive the applause of the people around you. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I see you at the other campuses too. I know you're up. I know you're up. Keep standing. Keep standing. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Keep standing. I know the tendency is to sit down when the applause of men stop. This is not a horizontal decision. This is a vertical decision. It's all about the cross. But this is a choice you're making for this right here. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to do a prayer together right now. And then they normally bring up a white dude to make it official. <laughs> so for that one campus with the brother, what's up, man? We're laughing in the middle of a life-changing moment. So we're about to pray. And if you're seated right now, but you need to be standing, you're seated right now, you need to be standing. I'm going to pray this prayer out loud, and I want you to repeat it in the privacy of your heart. Then I'm going to give you some really cool instructions. Dear God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to this earth to die for me. I believe it, and I receive it, that he rose again on the third day for me, for my sins. Thank you, Lord. Come into my house. Come into my heart and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Yo, give him a round of applause. I want you to sit down for a second. You can, you can be seated. I'm going to give you one more thing I want you to do. Now, this is for everyone who raised their hand. And this is at other campuses as well. This is for everyone who raised their hand, and even those who should have raised their hand. I want you to do something different than what you've always done, because I don't want you to continue to get what you've always got. You just made a big decision. So normally what happens is we come to church, we come in, we sit down, we get up, and we leave. For those who made this decision for Jesus today, I'm going to ask you to do something different. I don't, I'm not going to tell you specifically what to do, but I want you to just break the pattern of what you've always done. One thing I love to have people do is when we dismiss and everyone else is walking that way, what I want you to do is I want you to come this way. And what I want you to do is I want you to actually grab one of these pins and fill out your name and your information so this church, which is a legit church, can be in contact with you. It's not so much about them being in contact, it's about you being obedient. And here's what I mean by that. Why would I want you to practice this? Why would I want you to do this here? Why would I want you to come this way while everyone else is going that way? 
Because, because of the decision you made, God will speak to you when you leave this place. And chances are, he's going to ask you to go in a different direction than all your friends are going. And you would have already practiced it right here in this place. So listen, regardless to what's going on, because you'll be walking this way and people might not hit you because they're going the other way. Out there, the same thing will happen. You'll be thinking, I need to pick up my kids. I need to get something to eat. The same thoughts that you'll have out there will show up in here. And if you can make the decision right now in his house, regardless to what everyone else is doing, to come down here and finish the process, watch how much more God will finish the process he's already started today. So when we dismiss, I want you to take action. Pay attention to those thoughts in your mind and saying, no, I don't need to. This doesn't know. Be obedient and watch what he's going to do.